So we're talking about the, <clears throat> in this story, the woman is pushy and demanding and she wants Jesus to heal her. And she's, but then Jesus um, says, I don't, I don't uh, throw bread to the dogs. But there's truth to that, right? You don't throw bread to the dogs. If someone's not ready right. for something, then don't. You don't try to give something to someone who isn't asking for it. So she wasn't asking for it. She, what was she, she was doing? demanding. She was demanding. And she was using the same consciousness that created the problem in the first place. Right. That manifests itself in that problem, yes. So what's the difference between creating the problem and manifesting itself in the problem? Well, see, the software doesn't create a problem. It is the problem. Mm. And that problem manifests itself. Oh, okay. And then... Um, Jesus broke her out of it by saying, I don't throw bread to the dogs. This humbled her? Or how? Well, well she suddenly, she had a, this, e this eternal moment of awareness. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm willing to accept anything. Uh, she, she, she realized nothing was going to get her through that wall. Mm -hmm. And then she was healed. She just suddenly became receptive. So, any other thoughts on this? So we talk about there's pushy and demanding. So you would say that there was pushy and demanding. And then after this, I want to talk about Naaman, the story of Naaman. But there's pushy and demanding. Then there's persistent. Okay, there's pushy and demanding. There's uh, pious and deferential. So she could have been like pious and deferential. Oh, yeah. Oh, please. You're such a wonderful... You're... Or there's passionate and determined or... Yes. Persistent and dis disciplined. Yeah. So those are good, right? Yes. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Yeah. yeah, there's a biblical story that escapes my memory right at the moment of a of a woman that came to Jesus who was persistent and determined. I've forgotten. Is it Mary and Martha? No. Oh, the one who touches him and then she's healed. Can yeah. we talk about that story too? Oh yeah. So, but the idea is you don't want to be like pushy demanding because that's ego based, right? Or you don't want to be uh, pious, and pious and deferential because that's still ego based and it's still self-absorption and emotionalism and sentimentalism. But you do want to be passionate and determined. So that's when you're outside of yourself and you're seeking something or persistent and dis disciplined. Yeah. And this, this woman that she was being pushed around in the crowd and she reached up and she touched just touched the hem of his garment and Jesus said power has just flow, flown out of me and and it was because this of this the presence of this woman who was persistent and determined that she be healed and so she, she was willing to do whatever she needed to do to receive the gift that she knew was a, a potential for her because of that persistence. Trying to get there from here, it enabled her to understand that there is already here. So the power went through, he says, she touches his hem, the power went through him, she was healed. So what was the meaning of this? Well, <laughs> see, I, I, th that has always somewhat escaped me, how, how Jesus experienced but at least it was reported, or maybe it's legendary, maybe it's mythological. But somehow he was aware at that moment of the flows. Oh yeah, maybe, maybe suddenly she, he was aware that that she was in the flow. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. But also she, there's, there's like a story that she like moved her way through the crowd, and also like she's not as a woman, she's not supposed to touch him and stuff like that, and she broke out of that. Yeah, she and they, 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 suddenly he became aware of parallel beams of light. Maybe that was it. That's when he noticed the power. The put they potentiated the two, and she touched him. That potentiated, and it shed much light. So remember that story of Naaman. Can you describe this story uh, when Naaman and Elijah, when he dips into the Jericho River, and he's healed because he, he was first arrogant. And oh yeah. Yeah, one way. That's was it the old, old state? Old name and the king of the the Assyrian, yeah. the leader of the Assyrian army. Yeah. He had leprosy, and he tried to get everybody, all of his local practitioners and and chiropractors and everybody to heal him, and none of them could. And he 
probably tried all the religious leaders and none of them could even. And so <clears throat> the, the housekeeper overheard his conversation and lamenting that he couldn't be healed. And she said, well, I know of a person there in this town out in the desert. Um, <clears throat> the guy could heal you. So Naaman packed up his his um, Air Force One and all of his support troops and flew into the out to the desert and he got his entourage and limousines and they pulled up to to the prophet. I forget who it was Elisha or Elijah. 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 I get those mixed up too. I think it was Elisha. Yeah. But anyhow, the prophet and uh, <clears throat> honked his horn. Nobody came out, and he expected to have the red carpet rolled out for him. <laughs> and nobody came out, nobody acknowledged his superiority complex. His, nobody confirmed his illusion that he was a superior one. So finally he sent his chauffeur in, and Elijah wrote on a note, go bathe in the River Jordan, dip yourself three times in the River Jordan and you will be healed. And he, he brought the note back out to Naaman and Naaman threw a hissy fit. How dare he treat me in that such way? He won't even come out and talk to me. He tells me to go bathe in the River Jordan. I've got a hot tub jacuzzi at home and I've sat in there every day. I haven't been healed. So he said, get in the car, we're going back home. So as they were driving, the chauffeur turned around and said, you know, what would you have done if he'd asked you to donate $6 million to, um, to your health organization there and put your name in neon lights beneath the sign? Wouldn't you have done that? We got a point there. So he said, turn around, I'm gonna go back. So he went back, he dipped himself three times in the River Jordan and was immediately healed. Now again, it was because the shift from a position of assumed superiority and top dog, he suddenly up, he was awakened being in the presence of his chauffeur who was a, was, apparently in the flow and aware of Elijah who obviously was in the flow and and he dipped himself in the in the water and was immediately healed. And then the interesting thing was he came back to to Elijah and he said um, I'd like to give you this six million dollars. Elijah said, No need, I didn't do anything. You didn't, I don't deserve, deserve to be paid. You got in the flow and you were healed. Mm -hmm. So, so they got, they got in the, the motorcade, headed back to the airport and um, his, his um, chief operating assistant came up to him and said, you know, I feel sorry. How rude of Elijah to not accept your gift of, a half billion dollars, um, I'll take it, and I'll set up, set up my own church, and we'll, we'll be able to heal people. And so, Naaman gave him the money, and the guy took off, and ended up with a bad case of leprosy. And why did he get leprosy? Because he fell back into that same old software of trying to make it happen. And he had a container. He had a formula. I'm going to go out and I'm going to fix. So he saw himself as the healer and that he could create a healing ministry. Wait, who got leprosy just now? The, the servant got leprosy? No, the assist, uh, uh, Naaman's um, assistant. assistant, yeah. Not the chauffeur, but Naaman's assistant. His associate minister. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that, Captain?
No, it's a very interesting story. But again, it's a it's a mythological statement of the importance of a shift in consciousness, an upgrading of your software. I remember there was a story where Jesus, they, the disciples were catching fish on one side, but they couldn't catch anything, and then they put the net on the other side. Is that representing the shift in consciousness? Or yes. The, because then they see, caught like a ton of fish. Yeah. See, on the, they were trying to make it happen. They had a formula for how it worked, how to be a fisherman. Jesus said, let go of all of that. Turn the totally uh, shift your way of thinking and that was symbolized in throwing your net on the other side you know in a way that that you're just open to the possibility rather than relying upon the strategy oh uh, so that's getting in the flow or yeah by opening yourself to the possibility you're opening yourself to the flow you you you're changing from expectations and demands to expectancy and, and uh, openness. Any other thoughts that I got, man? No. So, so just, just a few more, just a couple more stories from the Bible really quick. And then, there, yeah, but just for right now, so hopefully, but uh, turn the other cheek. Jesus said, if you're hit, then turn the other cheek. What does this mean? That's the same, it's, it's another way of saying the same thing about the putting the nets on the other side. Turn the cheek of another whole attitude. Don't get involved. Don't tell yourself a story. Don't get all involved in his story. Turn, turn to a whole, whole different perspective. And, and, and show up without a story. And so when you turn the other cheek, you don't get hit. Because a lot of people think, okay, turn the other cheek, but make, make, really turn the other cheek and be inferior and, you know. Right. Let him hit you again. But you're saying raise your consciousness. Go yeah. Turn to a higher attitude, a higher yeah. consciousness. I share nothing in common with the world from which that first blow came. So so there's that Cohen, uh, the Zen Cohen, where the guy has a stick and he's going to hit the person. And you say, Hi, okay, he has this thing over his head and the person's kneeled. How does he get out of... Yeah. Is that it? Can you say it? Yeah. The, the Zen Cohen says... There's a stick. If you if you stay there, I will hit. I will strike you with this stick. If you attempt to move, I will strike you with this, this stick. So the question is, how does he get out of it? The question is, what's the solution to that koan? So what's the solution? Nothing to realize there is no stick, there is no thing, there is no problem to be gotten rid of, gotten free of. The problem is a creation of your story. Did he create the stick? Yes. We all create our own stick, our own shtick story. <laughs> Everybody I want to get deeper understanding that helps me, but okay. Any other thoughts on that, Grandpa? No. So, the person is okay. So we talk about that idea that if you are enslaved and stuff, you brought that because maybe it's your or if you're in any of those situations. Okay, how is this so? Like, well, it's your story. See, these situations do occur. But the issue is, can we allow them to occur without creating a story about it? See, I, I used to use the illustration. If you, if you were asked to take a woman, say your wife or your daughter or somebody you know real well, to the hospital because she was in labor and and um, you were rushing to get to the hospital and you suddenly you had to stop at a red light and somebody stepped out in, no somebody stepped out in front of you and you had to stop and they got mad at you and they came and they spit on your window what would you do now if they spit at your window and your window was down and it hit you what would you do or 
if at that very moment when you hit the brakes, the expectant mother's water broke and you had to get her to the hospital immediately, what would you do? Mm -hmm. You could you could you could tell yourself a story about each particular um, incident, but if the if the expectant mother's water broke, you wouldn't have time to tell yourself a story. You'd have to get to the hospital. Then after you got to the hospital, you may tell yourself a story. But at the moment, you didn't have the time to tell yourself a story. So therefore, there was no offense. Mm -hmm. But if you had the time, you could lousy SOB. Why would he do such? And you get all involved in your story, and you get involved in in road rage, etc. So, who created the problem? If that happened, the man who spit in your car, or you who told the story? You told the story, but but the thing is okay. But from another person's point of view, from outside, if he looked in on the point of view, he's going to say, oh, there was an offense that occurred. Even if you didn't tell yourself a story, that person there might tell himself a story about what happened there. Yeah. Yeah. All the other um, witnesses, the audience, could all come up with their own story about what happened. And, any other thoughts, Mr. Kevin? But I remember you talked about this idea. If someone spit on your shadow, did he spit on you? What if he spit on your shoe, did he spit on you? What if he spit on your... Where do you start? Where do you end? Yeah. How far up, how high up does he need to spit before he hits you? <laughs> so, what's the answer to that? Well, when do you start telling yourself a story? See, if, if at 5 o'clock the shadow is 50 feet away, the shadow of your head, and he spits on your head, it wouldn't occur to you to tell yourself a story. So you are your story. Well, you experience. Your experience is the result of the story you tell yourself. Mm -hmm. And we all do that. So but it's a flow letting go of all stories. Right? Exactly. You cannot be in the flow when you're in your story. The man at the sheep gate pool was so involved in his story that he couldn't be in the flow. So... Regardless, theory of general relativity, there's an invariance going on where it, the speed is determined by the point of view. I don't, I don't know how to explain it out right, but but wherever you're standing determines, you know, the, the speed of it is going to be determined by your relative distance, or I don't know, and the speed of it, like, it's all relative. But is there actually a spit hitting this guy despite the story. Yeah. Yeah, the event did occur. So I used to use the formula. Well, the event occurred in fact. The offense is a creation of your imagination. Is a creation of your story. And then you talked about that that mother who when the kid skid his knee, she's like, "Oh my gosh." Oh, no, no. Yeah. Okay, what was that thing? Well, she created a story, and then he borrowed her story and elaborated on it. Can you tell and the story of that story? Well, we don't know what story she told, but it's, oh my, something really monumental has so, occurred. So, so there's a, but there's... A, another mother could say, well, let me kiss it, and then she'll be fine. So she kisses it, and the kid goes out and plays. Doesn't think about it again. There's no story. So, if you don't consider yourself the body, and someone spits on your shadow or spits on you, then you're not gonna gonna be offended and everything. Right. So, like, there's that story too that Rabbi Akiva, when he was being tortured, he was laughing because they thought that they were torturing him. Yes. Well, there's a story in in about Jesus' crucifixion that he said, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." See, maybe he was just laughing. These, these guys think they're killing me. <laughs> think they're accomplishing something. We don't know, but that's probably a better explanation than... Any, any other thoughts? No.